30 years of investigation as a scientist have convinced me that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some UFOs are alien vehicles. Furthermore, it is clear now that the government of the United States, some few people within it, have known since at least 1947 when a crashed saucer was recovered complete with four alien bodies outside Roswell, New Mexico, that indeed the planet is being visited. The subject is a kind of cosmic Watergate. In March 1983, I was working on a documentary for home box office entitled UFOs, The ET Factor. During research, I was taken to Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where an Air Force Office of Special Investigations agent showed me several pages entitled Briefing Paper for the President of the United States of America on the subject of unidentified flying vehicles. The paper suggested strongly that our government has known for at least 40 years that extraterrestrials and their craft have been visiting this earth. Starting in 1976, Freedom of Information Act requests were filed with the U.S. government. These Freedom of Information Act requests asked for any documents that various intelligence agencies might have relating to UFOs. Over the last 10 years, a number of agencies have responded and have uh, generated several thousand pages of documents. These documents show that intelligence agencies in the United States government have maintained an interest in the UFO subject and tracked it for at least the last 40 years. Since 1975, I've worked with nearly 200 people who have reported in great detail having been abducted and, being, and having been taken aboard UFOs for very bizarre physical examinations. This sort of procedure takes place from childhood on as if these people are being followed uh, like a tagged animal, something of that sort. I've worked with army officers who have been abducted, uh, psychiatrists who have been abducted, scientists who have been abducted, uh, police officers, people from every walk of life. This is the core meaning of the entire UFO phenomenon. They are interested in us and they are studying us involuntarily. Welcome to Summit University Forum, where the flame of freedom speaks. I'm Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Historically, Americans have been called to be the keepers of the flame of liberty, and that liberty depends on innovative thinkers, the free exchange of ideas, and people with a can-do spirit. The forum you are about to see was filmed before thousands assembled at the Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana. This week, you'll hear the last of five segments of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's interview with four of the nation's leading authorities on UFOs, Stanton Friedman, Linda Howe, Dr. Bruce McAbee, and Bud Hopkins. Their topic, alien spacecraft and government secrecy. In part four, they discuss the mutilation of animals by aliens and spacecraft, and a presidential briefing paper on the subject of unidentified flying vehicles. Today, they will take an in-depth look at the abduction of humans by aliens and spacecraft. I am not going to go into great detail about the Kathy Davis case that I've gone into in my book, um, but uh, I'll go into some other, other material that... Uh, One I'm thing I'd like to say is I just recommend you read this book, Intruders, uh, because it's so detailed. Uh, it has commanded my most profound respect for Bud, yes, thank uh, you. as well as everyone here who has, has similarly defined the subject. Uh, but it is extremely vivid. Uh, you, you live through this experience. Well, it is, uh, of course, so deeply involved in the humanity of the people who have had these experiences uh, in their psychology and their sense of themselves in the world that it is... Uh, it is hard to imagine anything more profound occurring to somebody. One of the questions about that we must always remember, I've had people say, uh, well, uh, from the uh, Shirley MacLaine side, well, uh, if these were, uh, if the abductees were more spiritually evolved, uh, she said this, uh, they somehow wouldn't have to have these experiences happen to them. Well, we're talking about people who might be abducted at the age of nine months or 
three years old. They're, these people, what resources does a three-year-old have uh, against this sort of situation? The resources are none, and these experiences are dreadfully upsetting. We have done extensive psychological testing with a number of abductees. Uh, we have found no uh, sign of uh, the kind of mental problems that one would associate with a fantasist and someone <coughs> imagining all of this. These experiences sometimes happen to a number of people together. I have one case that involves six people. In Ohio, they were coming back on a little hike, young people with a, an adult, and uh, uh, one of their little group ran ahead to the house uh, to make some cocoa or whatever, and as they walked through the trees, suddenly there was this enormous bluish light shining on all of them. They felt they couldn't move. The next thing they knew, the light was gone. They described it as big as a baseball diamond in size. When it had gone, they felt very peculiar, and they were not lined up in the same way they had remembered being in, when the light first shone on them. They came into the house, and there was something like an hour to an hour and a half missing time should be attested to by that one person who had run ahead, saying, where have you been all this time? They were not aware of the missing time. Well, I've done hypnosis with two of the people who were involved in that experience, uh, and neither of whom had really been in touch with one another after this happened, uh, and under hypnosis uh, recovered virtually identical accounts. This is something that is not the product of a personal imagination. It is extraordinarily traumatic. It is extraordinarily... Uh, upsetting to someone feeling helpless. Now, what I'd like to do is show some slides. May I have this? Uh, yes. Uh, just show some slides. This is very, very quick about um, uh, some of the, um, the drawings that have been done, <clears throat> some of the faces. Now, I told you the story about the man whose only uh, recollection was a dread of a certain stretch of highway, one of the major a dread of a certain place is very common. Uh, this is a drawing made uh, by Ted Jacobs, uh, who I also introduced to Whitley Strieber, and he had uh, Ted do the drawing for his cover of his book, The Pastel. Uh, but the my, man that I had been describing had uh, Ted make the drawings of these figures. Now, it's interesting, almost everybody, when they finish the drawing or have the drawing done, they look at it and say, it's sort of right, but it's not quite right. It never seems to be exactly on target. It's an odd thing. Uh, but that's a typical example. Now, this we'll have to get back a little bit to see together. Uh, the drawing on the right was done by Kathy Davis. The one on the left was drawn by a woman from North Carolina who had a UFO experience. When I uh, was giving a lecture one time and showed that slide, the woman who had made the drawing on the left had never seen the one on the right, and she took one look at the two together and came up to me after the, tech, the lecture and tears were running down her face and she said how shocked, horrified she'd been when she saw this. She said, you know, but I don't want to believe that happened to me, that it really happened to me. But seeing the figure on the right sort of cemented to her the idea that they're being so similar that in fact this is, she had encountered these people. We're describing figures again who are roughly uh, the descriptions run from very small, three feet or so, to maybe up to almost five feet. Uh, this is a drawing uh, involving uh, a case in, in Canada, and the woman gave us a nice side view to show that the eyes wrapped around the side. Now, her conscious recollection of her abduction is interesting. Uh, she remembered, uh, and this is part of the vagaries of recollection in these cases, it's as if the wiping out of the memory is an imperfect science as far as they're concerned. They seem to be able to block the memory, but not always exactly. This maybe, woman remembers. Maybe they don't want to. Uh, maybe they don't want to, uh, but it, it's, it's worked in a very odd way where one man had an abduction experience which involved the missing time period of about two hours, but subsequently he forgot the, all the events of the whole week. It's as if. And, and yet he was going about his business. He went to work, he came home, his family were in touch with him and so forth. But it's as if they gave him a little overdose of anesthetic and it took everything else with it along with the abduction experience. But this woman uh, awoke, she was, uh, I believe, eight or nine years old, I've forgotten. She woke up in the middle of the night in a farm in, uh, near Toronto, outskirts, uh, found herself absolutely compelled to get go downstairs and go outside 
uh, and she walked out not knowing where she was going and walked down a, a road, she knew exactly where she had to go, walked up a field and she saw this illuminated square form with, against the black mass and it turned out to be a doorway uh, in, a, in an object and there were these two little people standing there and she knew that she had to walk right inside again as if she was compelled. And she remembers that they said, now this is all conscious recollection, that she was to get on this table. And she took one look at the table and this implication of helplessness and so forth and said, no way am I getting on that table. And the next thing she knew, <laughs> she was walking back up the road to the house. Uh, and she remembered all of that consciously. Of course, the part she didn't remember is that she ended up on the table. Many times people think that they have won this little battle uh, and in fact they haven't. This is a, a, a drawing, a three-quarter head, and this is a case in Erie, Pennsylvania. This woman awoke uh, on, she'd had many experiences, it's quite complex, but one rather bizarre one. She awoke uh, hearing a strange sound outside the window, and there was a tree branch outside. She remembered the tree branches shaking and jumping, and uh, as if she heard something walking on the roof. Uh, but then the next thing she knew she was back in bed and uh, had no recollection of what happened except that uh, the branches were broken there was something very strange that had occurred under hypnosis uh, the craft had come directly down next to this window her bedroom with a second story window she was taken out the window into the craft and under hypnosis the way the scene ended they put her back on the windowsill, the second story window, and she remembered sitting on the windowsill and watching this thing moving away. And then looking around and realizing that here she is in her nightgown up there. <laughs> How did she get there as the memory had been taken away? This is interesting because it's a three-quarter head and we don't have too many of those. Now this is a, draw a little sculpture by Kathy Davis, uh, the central figure in Intruders. And uh, she made it of ceramic afterwards and we had a, a meeting once of our support group and Kathy had brought this along and she had it sitting on a little counter and when the first couple of abductees walked in everybody sort of jumped looking at it didn't like looking at it and finally uh, a woman who was rather fiery of temperament marched straight over to it and wrapped both her hands around its skinny little neck and it went like that and it was enormous <laughs> everybody felt this great sense of relief <laughs> But I said, it was, the, it was their thought, but they were still afraid to go over. Uh, and, and incidentally, the kind of terror that people feel is so unreasoning uh, by, to someone who hasn't had the experience. One man who's a very big, burly man said to me, but if I were in my bed and I have a, a gun on my bed table and I saw them come in the door, which had happened to him in his bedroom, and the gun was there, he said, I'd pick up the gun and kill myself. Not them. Not them, himself. Because the terror was that great. But you just said it had happened to him? It, 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 this had actually happened without the gun. He didn't have a gun at the oh, time. One detail, but I mean, that, that's the level of terror, and I've heard this from other cases, and I have at least three cases where I'm absolutely convinced that a person was tipped over the edge into suicide because of their UFO experiences. It's that, it's that level of terror is, is very, very powerful. Now, the thing about the Kathy Davis head, which is really kind of charming, I said, Kathy, why do you have the head inclined back, looking like that? And she said, well, that's why I always see him. He's only this big, and he's always looking up at me. <laughs> it's realism. <laughs> this is a case, a drawing uh, of, a, of a case that occurred actually in the Bronx, New York. I have within Manhattan itself some abductions. A craft has come down perfectly black, dark at night, right above a building, and a person has taken up a beam uh, right out through their apartment building or whatever. In one case, uh, a man and his sister, uh, whose parents, incidentally, are extremely, the father is extremely well known in, in uh, theatrical areas. Uh, the father and uh, mother were uh, putting, Christmas present under the tree and so on and so forth and suddenly uh, this man, my, the abductee I was working with, with his sister, they were a little tiny, uh, perhaps three and five years old, uh, were just somehow floated out of their beds into the room where the parents were and the parents were frozen, unable to move and un as if they're in suspended animation, we get this in many cases, and this man and his 
as a boy and his sister were taken up a beam of light into the craft. Uh, and under hypnosis, it was extraordinarily touching because his sister was on another table and she was being uh, examined and was crying and he was trying to comfort her even though he was only say five years old or six years old. But when he first got in this place, not knowing what was happening, it was Christmas Eve, under hypnosis, and this is a grown man reliving it as if he were a child, there's this long silence and he suddenly says, where's Santa Claus? And bursts into tears, sobbing and sobbing. He knew that somehow it was magical, it had some property of, he didn't know whether it was Santa Claus was involved or what. But at any rate, this uh, drawing was made by a man who's experienced a different person occurred in the Bronx, New York. I have people from all the boroughs of, of New York City. What, what do you think of this selection process? Obviously these people are chosen and pre-selected. And could they be of uh, descendants of an evolution or even reincarnated of individuals who had been with those spacecraft? 10,000 years ago, uh, 50,000 years ago? I suppose anything is uh, possible. We have tried to do psychological testing of varying sorts, interviews and so on, to look for any patterns in these people. The patterns that we've gotten psychologically are very similar, according to the psychologists, of the sorts of deficits that turn up in tests done with rape victims. Uh, a sense of lowered self-esteem, a sense of great fear about the outer world, and a sense of not trusting their own bodies, their own physicality. Have you ever taken a subject and regressed someone who's had multiple abductions to the next previous lifetime and gone back to see if in that incarnation they had also been abducted? We've never, I've never gotten involved in doing past life uh, uh, hypnosis. Uh, uh, we, I take my mysteries one at a time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Very good answer. <laughs> A Canadian abductee, a woman, when asked the question of, you know, why were you chosen? Why is anybody chosen? Her response was that they told her that they could tune in easier to certain kinds of people than others, implying that there's some kind of electromagnetic or other way of monitoring people to see who they can control or communicate with or whatever. Have you heard that kind of thing? It's from the same woman you talked about before, but... Uh, I would not believe anything I hear from an alien uh, any more than I would believe anything I hear from Ed Meese. <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying there's a certain degree of sense in the notion that when you scan, if you find somebody you can tune in on easier, that, that makes the job yeah, easier. Why can you the, tune in? The, Is it a genetic tie? The, What's the link? See, there's got to be a link. But the, the big thing is that we're dealing with people who are being tracked because of their genetic position. In other words, that they are the daughter or son of somebody who has already been abducted. So we're going across generations. It doesn't seem to be random that way. I mean, they definitely seem to lock on to people who are in a certain bloodline, which connects it with a, a physical thing more than, let's say, a psychological or spiritual thing, although that may be involved. But certainly the physical thing seems to be very central to it. Now, uh, earlier, as a matter of fact, uh, Linda said something about locations, that certain times things happen in a certain area. It also works completely the other way around too. That I have one ab abductee uh, who I've been working with, a young woman, who was abducted in Ohio where she was born as a little child several times. Uh, she went to Spain and was abducted in Spain and she also uh, was in South America, in Argentina, was abducted there. So it didn't make a difference where she went, they, she was being tracked. This uh, slide we have here is uh, from uh, a drawing made by a woman who uh, was shown evidently at the nursery where these little fetuses are developed. The figure at the left was her idea of the more adult figure and the little fetus in the foreground, fetus-like thing. She later said that the body is too small in proportion to the head. But these are rather ugly and rather terrifying, to put it mildly, and the little tank is the object at which the thing was floated. Now, one of the details I kept out of my book are descriptions of the nursery where these little babies are developed, uh, which are very similar, and I have in a number of cases, and so we've had people fill in. Incidentally, one thing about the drawings, a man who uh, contacted me a while ago, he did not know I'd written a book or anything about this, um, remembered everything consciously without hypnosis, and this is many, many of these cases. 
uh, he came to my studio and uh, finally when I won his confidence and he began telling me things that had happened to him uh, he said but they put something they put something up my nose on made my nose bleed. And he said, I was only five years old. He said, I remember them sticking. He said, have you ever heard of that? And I said, well, maybe 50 or 60, 70, 80 times. He was stunned to find out that. At any rate, I had him make a drawing of the figure that he recalled, having been in the craft. He sat down very carefully making this, this drawing. And when he finished it, it was so much like the others. I took the, I opened my book, Intruders, which she did not know about. Uh, and he came up with many details from in this account that had not been printed in Intruders. Uh, and I had absolutely no reason to doubt him. I showed him the book, showed him these pictures. I just slid it over to him on the table. He took one look, his eyes hit those pictures, and he jumped like that, and then burst into tears. And this is a man, I would say, in his middle 30s, married, very substantial businessman, but he sobbed and sobbed. It was such a horrifying shock. To, he said, where did you get those pictures? And I said, I got them the same way I got your picture. And I apologized for showing it to them, him so quickly. But uh, these, he showed me a scar on his leg. He remembered them cutting his leg when he was a little boy. And uh, he said, have you ever heard of anything like that? And I said, yes, I have. Uh, this, these are two scars <coughs> on the calf, the front of the calf of uh, Kathy Davis. Uh, these are what we call the scoop marks. They're a little round, uh, they're smaller than your little fingernail, and they're d distinct depressions as if a little, almost like ice cream scoop tool was used to remove layers of cells. They were done at two different times. I'll show you a close-up of what they look like. Doctors have been extremely interested in these because uh, one doctor asked her if she'd ever had a uh, bone marrow uh, sample taken or couldn't figure out what would cause this uh, little depression. Now. This is the leg of her mother. Talk about the generations. This is a close-up in another light of the mark on her mother's leg. Uh, the scoop mark here. Two generations of the same family. This uh, is a little harder to see. I hope everybody, yeah, if we zoom in a little bit. There's a straight line cut to one side and the scoop mark down at the end of it. This occurred, just to show you the distribution of this, uh, on uh, the leg of a woman who is now about uh, 32 years old, and this occurred when she was about four living in France. This is a French abduction. Same exact thing happening. That's a, this is a close-up of uh, a scoop mark on the back of a man who was abducted uh, from Brooklyn. This man's uh, mother is an American and black, and his father is from Pakistan. And there seem to have been other experiences, abductions in that family. It's not yet been thoroughly explored. This is the uh, scoop mark, and yet another case. It's sort of unfortunate to be sitting. I think this is probably enough. We can turn off the slides. Sitting here looking at scars is not the most pleasant thing, but I don't know whether it's better than looking at Linda's carcasses. I have to think about that. <laughs> it's one of the things. <laughs> uh, this isn't all fun, what we do here. Um, you know, I'd like to comment on the terror that you are describing. Uh, generations of young men have gone to war, died on the battlefield. Uh, people pass on heroically from, from terminal diseases or traumatic things. And death is not so great a terror as you have described. And therefore, what terror could be? greater Living to the human with, psyche well, what, the one unknown. man death one man told me the, one man said the following thing this is a chemist who was abducted he said bud when i was he went up some kind of a beam right out of his car and was brought down into this room from a from the top of the room this is very unusual usually it's through the floor and as he's being lowered down he said standing on this floor looking up are these little gray figures more or less identical just looking up at him dispassionately there's a table. It's very clear he's headed for the table. And he said, Bud, I didn't know what or who they were looking at me. I had no idea what they were. There was no emotion, no way to read it. They weren't standing there with, uh, like, like they're about to attack him and do something, where you might actually get some kind of uh, adrenaline going and fight back. They're just dispassionate, just staring. 
He said, I didn't know where I was, what this room was, that I was just now being transported into it. And he said, and my body didn't work. I couldn't even get an arm up to my face. And he said, every single familiar thing had been taken away from me. My surroundings, these, my fellow man, my ability to move my arm, every single familiar thing was gone. And he said, when every familiar thing is gone, you know an absolutely bottomless terror because there's nothing to relate it to. Another man told me in, a, in another case, he said, you know, but I, I had two things happen to me terrible last year. He said, my father died after a long illness, and he said, I had a major setback in my career. And these were both very disturbing. But he said, I was kind of prepared for them. I, you sort of understand that it's gonna happen and so forth. And he said, I could take them, but this experience, an abduction, he said there was nothing in the world to prepare me for. I had no idea from moment to moment what was going to happen next. He said with a, a mugger, if a guy has a gun on you and you're fishing for your wallet and trying not to look him in the eye so you know, to avoid that, you can at least, you, you hear the cars going by, you hope somebody might show up and you know that if the mugger runs away in two minutes without having shot you, you're probably all right. You, you know certain things. He said, I had nothing to go on, not a single solitary thing. And that sense of unknown, that sense of profound terror, it was just, is just beyond the pale. Now, w one last thing, and I, then I'm gonna end this because I don't wanna, gone awfully late, but it's an interesting thing. There's something I call the skeleton key effect. And that is that when a person realizes that he or she has had these experiences, uh, that knowledge unlocks a lot of strange behavior in that person's life that the person himself, herself, has never really understood. Uh, why I have had such and such a peculiar terror about something or other, a certain place, or, or certain phobias, or certain kinds of behavior. One man I was talking to about this the other day, and. I said, mentioned, somebody said they didn't like to be touched in a certain place, actually the region of the navel, because there had been these needles inserted in the abdomen. And he said, always, he said, isn't that funny? He said, the one thing I can't ever stand is somebody to touch me lightly like this. He said, that I just totally fall apart. He said, I want a real touch. But this just drives me nuts. And of course, he's remembering these little hands these little strange these fingers little that have moved. webbed hands. There's a man who uh, is a police officer, and uh, he uh, told me that he had had this phobia about being terrified of spiders. He said, black widow spiders, I have just, he said, I've hated them and I've been afraid of them. And he said, that's my only phobia. And I said, well, a lot of people have phobias like that. And he said, well, I remember how this started. And I just asked him about phobias without uh, uh, necessarily connecting with UFOs. Uh, and I said, well, a lot of people have spider phobias. And he said, well, mine started when I was five years old. I was sleeping in, in my little bed right next to the window. I remember I woke up in the middle of the night and right in the, in the corner of the window was a spider's nest with a couple of black widow spiders in it. And he said, I was so scared and I pulled the blanket over my head and he said, I, I just huddled there. And in the morning, I just screamed for my mother and I asked her to take away the spider's nest. And she said, there, there's nothing there in the window. And he said, you know, there wasn't. There was nothing there. I couldn't figure it out. And he said, my mother explained the black widow spiders don't build nests in a sunlit area like a window. They go under porches and back under things. And uh, he said, I, from that moment on, developed this terrible fear of black widow spiders. And I would go out looking for them uh, to kill them. He said, I was scared of them, but I wanted to kill them. And I would get stones and I would go back under decks and places and I would see, find them and I would smash them. <laughs> and I said, and he said, this went on for years. He said, just to still, this is a guy who had been involved in gun battles. He said, still to think of them scares me and I hate them. Uh, and I said, well, uh, I said, I don't understand this thing about this white nest, spider's nest. I'm thinking a great big open web, you know. He said, it was just one of those white spider's nests. And I'm thinking, I just don't know enough about spiders, I guess, I didn't understand. He said, it was right in the corner of the window. And I said, well, how many black widow spiders were in it? And he said, two. He said, they were very shiny and black. He said, they were just like this. Uh... And when he went like that, he looked at his hands and he did that. He just, uh, it, it just hit him extremely powerfully. There's a man who was, 
lifted up in a light beam as a little boy into a UFO abduction experience, a typical story. And he said, now as, as he explored this and got into it and other things, he said he remembered something that was extraordinarily upsetting to him when he was a little boy, sad to him, not upsetting. He said the Venetian blinds were at a slant and this beautiful light beam, sunbeam, was coming through the Venetian blinds. And he had a little toy soldier and he was quite small. This is right after this experience. He picked up a little toy soldier, held it in the light beam and let go and the thing fell to the floor. He couldn't figure it out. He was very upset. He picked it up and held it in the, in the sunbeam two or three times, let go, and each time, of course, it fell to the floor. And he went in crying to his mother that the beam wasn't holding the soldier. <laughs> couldn't understand why that would be. She had no idea why it should hold the soldier. Uh, he, 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 of course, knew. This boy said that the first time he was taken around that time uh, to a large office building where there was an elevator, he got in the elevator with his mother and he said, it's not going fast enough, it's, go it's too slow, it's not going fast enough. And she said, but you've never been on an elevator before. He said, I know, but they go faster than this. And then when the doors opened on the 12th floor and he stepped out, he said, we're still in the building. <laughs> And she couldn't understand where all this was coming from. But the point is, I, uh, this skeleton key effect, I'm, this is just a touching on the situation. It's usually much more profound than what I'm, these are little light examples. But it's as if people who've had these experiences have been leading secret lives that they knew nothing about. And if they had been abducted 10 or 20 or 30 times, uh, they're conditioned by these experiences. We are working on ways in which they can begin to regain a sense of their own power, to regain the illusion of control or something. It's very, very difficult, but uh, the problem must be addressed. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we're in the position of, I'm in the position of working with people uh, just to get them through the, the trauma and try to explore what's happened. And I had, as I s said earlier, I my sense of myself is that I've been so busy in the emergency room running around with the band-aids and the tourniquets that I haven't had a chance to approach the public health issues that we really have to have to uh, address to see what can be done but it is a central central problem right now the abduction situation may involve hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people maybe larger numbers than that thank you thank you God I think we need to make the point here, Elizabeth, that one of the reasons, clearly one of the most important reasons, that the experience is so distressing to the people who have it, is they haven't been prepared for it. And it's that our own society, in a sense, is inflicting the damage. There are often cases where the aliens are what I would describe as reassuring, as, you know, it's going to be over, it won't be, take so that. long, and so forth. Yeah, now, Book, uh, Bud's books, Missing Time and the Intruders, perform a really beneficial role because that might lead to a lot of people being much less fearful of the unknown if it isn't unknown anymore. I know that some of the people I've worked with who have apparently been abducted are very much reassured by the difficult for them task of reading the book because it brings back so many memories. But the notion that they're not the only one, that this has happened to other people, is very comforting and reassuring and helps break apart some of the defenses. So that the antidote to the terror seems to me to be better public education that this experience has been going on. That doesn't mean approving of the experience. It doesn't mean to the aliens, hey, come on, fellas, come on down here. But it means that it's our society that has determined the reaction much more than the intrinsic difficulty of the experience. The people are actually, in, by facing ridicule, by facing oh, yes. the government cover-up, facing the idea that the government is saying to them, you haven't had this experience yeah. because there are no such things as UFOs, and so therefore, you must, must be, be a little nuts, exactly. Yeah. They, it, it is very much like telling the rape victim, well, you were a slut who brought this on yourself. It's the same, it's the same horrifying thing. It's, of course, um, extremely important for an abductee to understand that 
he or she is not alone. But this is really the most recent phase of a situation that's been going on ever since the 40s. Um, just to say that you saw some object that doesn't exist is sufficient to bring down the house upon your head. Even though most people believe in UFOs, most people think that most people don't believe in UFOs. It's the problem of the uh, emperor and clothes, which I'm sure you all remember, mm -hmm. that um, everybody could see that he wasn't wearing any clothes, but nobody dared say to anybody else that he or she could see that the emperor didn't have any clothes, and it wasn't until some kid stood up and said, he doesn't have any clothes. <laughs> all of a sudden, everybody agreed. There's another analogy here in today's society. I hope you're not talking about conditioning, however, and no. therefore receptivity. No. The situation for today's abductee is very similar to what it was for victims of child abuse, sexual abuse of children, 25 years ago. I'm sure we're all aware of people who tried to report the experience to doctors, to teachers, to family and who were in effect totally rejected because such things didn't happen. Okay, now we recognize that they do happen. There are support groups. Mm -hmm. There's a general recognition it's a major problem, that there are things that can be done about it. The abductee is still in the dark ages of 25 years ago, the way the sexual abuse victim was. And so uh, it's why it's so important that people like Bud do what they're doing, put it all out there. Now, receptivity is another, another question. We're also setting up uh, support groups and locating uh, really sympathetic therapists, hypnotists, and investigators. This takes a, a let's say, a, a careful touch. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of damage that can be done by blundering into this. Uh, so we are setting up groups, and I think progress is being made in a, on a quite remarkable level. Is it feasible to bring up the question that we could ask our audience if they have a question or two? What I'd like to do is uh, painfully forego that uh, in favor of your you four bringing up uh, typical questions and answers briefly. I always get asked, have I seen one? Uh, the kids especially want to know that. And my answer is no. Bruce, have you had a sighting? I saw a black spot once. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a classic yes. UFO sighting. I've seen two. You've seen two flying saucers. What yes. had a sighting? I'm the only one who has. I had a day daytime sighting in 1964, which is what got me interested in this. We have any other questions? <laughs> why don't they talk to us? Is a, you know, why don't the aliens land on the White House lawn and say, "Take me to your leader"? Uh, I mean, the obvious answer is there is no leader to be taken. So, you know. <laughs> Speaking of the leader, it might be interesting to ask the question, a rhetorical question that we could ask the leader, uh, President Reagan, why is it that for the fourth time now over the past two years, True. you, President Reagan, have pointed out to uh, Gorbachev and other people that, uh, as he said to Gorbachev, our job would be much easier if uh, we were suddenly realized that there were an alien threat from the outside or words to that effect. Um, for him to say that once, 1985 in Geneva, you can sort of overlook it. It's just a rhetorical comment on his part. Then he says it again, and uh, he said it a third time at the United Nations last fall, and I believe once more this spring, is it? Chicago this spring. The, the answer uh, sounds is... Sounds very repetitive. And no, it sounds just is... like what uh, Stan was pointing out earlier, that uh, um, the viewpoint of Earthlings would change if Earthlings knew that they were being viewed by somebody else as Earthlings. Um, you know, the, the great gift to be able to see yourself as others see you. See, essentially, Reagan forgot that he'd asked it before. It's just one of those things that slipped his mind, so he keeps, keeps coming. He's a script reader, not a script writer. If it's there four times, yeah. there's some meaning there. we got to find out who's writing the script. Tried. Didn't get anywhere. Well, one of the things that I think uh, that the 40s could also have been about that isn't often discussed, but is still a possibility, if the briefing paper that I saw is correct and the videotape that Bill Moore and Jamie Chandray have uh, received, 
in terms of the aliens, these particular uh, gray ETs, having been here for at least 25,000 years, then the 1940s could perhaps have been something akin to a Trojan horse or a theatrical demonstration that the crashes themselves were orchestrated in order to bring themselves closer into human contact without us panicking because by having a crash of something and it's dead, it's more approachable and it's more dealable and that this whole long sort of theatrical scenario could be something akin to some there, kind of Trojan horse. There's an alternative, of course, which basically is that uh, these creatures aren't infallible, uh, which I think, if true, is a, a, a major um, discovery by the human race. If they crash, there's something we can do to defend ourselves. We may not know what it is yet, but uh, since we don't know what's going on, we better at least keep our options open and uh, to, to tacitly assume, because they've got this tremendous technology, that there's nothing we could do if they decided to uh, abduct us all in a blue beam up to the moon or something. Bruce, um, remember the great... Uh, all right. There may be something we can do. Remember the, the, the great uh, image of that. It's from The Wizard of Oz, the wicked witch of the north who has limitless power until you hit her with a bucket of water and she melts there may be some very peculiar vulnerability, some very bizarre vulnerability. I'm reminded of the War of the Worlds <laughs> yes. by yeah. Wells, where these creatures of tremendous technology in effect attacked the Earth and the human race, and it was in fact the Earth that beat them. There's one other thing in terms of their technology too, in the story of my brother, the missile site where the UFO sat down over it, or hovered over it. Uh, within two days, they had sent a team out to examine the computer targeting information in the missile. And they discovered that, in fact, the targeting information had been changed electromagnetically on the tape, and it was very selective. And then, within a week, the entire missile had been changed. The one had been taken out, and a new one had been put in. The very ability to selectively change electromagnetic targeting information on a missile, and I've heard that this story has happened in other places also, would suggest a control over electromagnetic frequencies that we can't comprehend or understand. And to some extent, in a strange way, when I have heard some of these stories, I have thought that as bleak as sometimes some of the aspects of all of this seem to be, that perhaps that in itself indicates some kind of an intelligence that is communicating in a very indirect way, that it has this incredible skill, at least technologically, that is intimidating on one hand, but may also indicate that they are restraining themselves in some strange way also. But if they can so change this programming, you can change the programming of the human brain. Yes, and they appear to do that. I, I think that we always have to uh, remember that our minds function anthropomorphically. We, we view things in terms of human motivations. We tend to have the, the good guys and the bad guys in that scenario all the time. I think that uh, we underestimate the extent to which there may be ultimately a gigantic communications gap between an alien intelligence and us. We share this planet with porpoises and porpoises are mammals and presumably have brains uh, which have some of the ca same capabilities as ours and our scientists are busily putting on bathing suits and going down in the tanks and trying to talk to the porpoises and there is some kind of shared something but it isn't much in terms of communication I think the scientists are quite frustrated that we're not really able to sit around and talk to porpoises it's as if porpoises are very content to lead porpoise lives and do porpoise things and I think they look at uh, the scientists trying to talk to them and wonder exactly what that's all about. And it's irrelevant to them. I think we are a very gregarious species. Uh, we somehow think we can work it out. Let's sit down here over the table and we'll talk. I think these intelligences may actually, their brains may just work very differently than ours. And it's a mistake to assume that everything that happens is intentioned. Uh, some of the pain and, and awful stuff that occurs in these abductions, uh, an analogy was once made by Dr. 
Albert Ellis in another context. He said you could be sitting on a bus with your foot out in an aisle reading a paper and all of a sudden there was this crushing horrible pain on your foot and your toes are crushed and you look up in agony and there's a blind man standing on your foot. And he said, it doesn't make the foot hurt less, and it doesn't cripple you less, but you sort of have to adjust yourself to the idea that it was not an intended act. And I think that there's something in these cases, uh, even though there's a tremendous callousness, that uh, one would make a, a, one, it would be a mistake to assume a lot of this is intended. And it certainly is a mistake to assume that communication would be natural and easy between us and them. And it, it, we, there just may be an ultimate gap of understanding. The thing is that they're communicating with the porpoises, which are the only intelligent life on the planet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to know if you're assuming that these three foot high beings are androids, that they are a robot creation no. sent by superior beings to they're probe not, they and take specimens. To, they don't seem to be thought that way by the people, the abductees who deal with them. Uh, even though sometimes there's some very strange, uh, you know, uh, movements which are absolutely coordinated and simultaneous and all that. The general feeling that the abductees have is that they're dealing with uh, intelligence of a human, of a non-artificial sort. Well, why, why? They may be wrong about why that assumption. Why create a robot uh, having a programming uh, even of some they, uh, semblance, they for could. instance this reassuring yeah. sense, but you look into these eyes and there's no end to them, yeah. uh, as though they were probes, and they're probing you and they're communicating back to you, it's all right, nothing's going to happen to you. It, that's all certainly possible. I mean, you know, we have to admit the, the, the limits of what we can say for sure about this. That's why I would say the safest thing Safest thing to me is not government documents, <laughs> with all due respect to all your researches, because the government is, of course, a very odd source of truth. Um, uh, I think that the, the safest thing to go by is what people are telling you about what they have seen and what they have experienced firsthand. And uh, because if they say the UFO occupants said so-and-so to me, I have to always say, well, take that with the same kind of grain of salt that you would take a statement coming out of a, uh, you know, public uh, spokesman and spokesperson in Washington. Uh, so, uh, one phrase that abductees have used occasionally, it's a repetitive enough to bring up, is something that reminded them of a praying mantis. Whatever it is they've encountered, that's what the description they will use is praying mantis. And that is an insect. And they also describe that communication is in their mind, it's not here. And in a letter that, to date, I don't think anybody has thrown out the Sarbacher letter, have they? No, Which from he's, Sarbacher? Yeah, Sarbacher. the one that suggests that there Sarbacher, is an Sarbacher insect, statement. the yeah. insect evolution. And the, this is a man who was not part of this group, but knew some of these people and was tangential, apparently, to perhaps one possible research aspect of what MJ-12 was doing, although he may not have known about MJ-12. And he refers to knowledge that whatever the evolutionary uh, background of these creatures that were taken out of the craft, it was suggested that they were insect-like. So if you put these pieces together and say that there have been a, has been a pattern of abductees using the term praying mantis, uh, mind communication, um, a letter from history that says that they came from an insect-like evolution, you're talking about something that is so alien to a primate and that the primate would have to be so alien to that insect that what Bud is talking about, that this gigantic gap that we, we perhaps, they're as afraid of us as we are of them, but they have much more control over us. That really the essence of what seems this seems to be coming down to is a collective hive mind operation versus us as individuals. I, I thought that you or one of you had some data on beings that resembled ourselves that could pass for humans also having been seen in these craft. That's, that's, that's right. That's way back. That's, that's, right. that's in uh, many of the reports. Often cooperating <coughs> as part of, with the small grayish white figures as if they're all working they together. Are in charge of them? No, sometimes it works one way, sometimes the other way. We've gotten it both ways yeah. where the uh, 
it, it's it's extremely complex. Loads of mystery. But yeah. these individuals could walk off a craft and disappear yes. into a city and yes. uh, dress as we dress and not be noticeable. Nordic looking. Nordic yeah. looking. Nordic types. looking. And we don't understand. I don't think any of us understand. Well, does anyone wish to ask a question? I'd like to address the um, question to the whole group. Um, this entire night we've talked about it from the angle of uh, the American cover-up of the UFO. I'm just wondering your experience and the people you've talked to, and especially your government contacts, do you have any um, belief or proof that the Soviets also have um, been contacted by these UFOs? There's a very important book that is now, for the first time, being distributed in the United States by Timothy Good. It's called Above Top Secret, and it is about the worldwide government cover-up of UFO information. It was published in England last summer, and it is now just being distributed in the United States. For anybody who would like to see a larger picture painted from uh, what we have been talking about tonight and extended into other governments, they should try to find that book. There's a, certainly been a cover-up in Canada and England, which doesn't even have a freedom of information law to speak of. There's certainly been a cover-up there, too. The Soviet Union is a different sort of question. They ebb and flow. I wonder how many people know that uh, about three years ago they appointed a committee on anomalous atmospheric phenomena. That's a fancy name. Uh, but directly related to UFO sightings, headed by Pavel Popovich, a cosmonaut, and with the full cooperation of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, and following a publication a few years earlier of a large study of Soviet sightings done by three members uh, supported by the Soviet Academy of Sciences. I haven't heard one thing since the establishment of that committee about what they found, and most Americans aren't aware of the establishment of that committee. Uh, but we're dealing with certainly a worldwide problem. Uh, military and many other countries are involved. Uh, remember that the very notion of freedom of information is, if you'll pardon the expression, an alien notion to most countries. Uh, the real notion in most countries is that the government has the right and the duty to protect the public from what the government doesn't want them to know. That may sound strange, but that's the way it is in many countries. Yeah, well, just one other question. Um, we've been talking about space. The obvious question is, have they um, helped Soviet or American space programs, in your opinion? Help is an interesting word. There is some indication that we have learned a great deal from the wreckage and perhaps from the extraterrestrial biological entities themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean they teach us how to fly, so to speak. But there's all kinds of t useful technology you could glean from the wreckage, whether it's how to build a better permanent magnet or the shape of the vehicles. Remember, we used to think the high-speed vehicle had to be pointy nose, sharp wing, X-15 type. Mm -hmm. And look, all our manned spacecraft don't look like that at all, really. I mean, the Apollo, the Gemini, all of these are round, blunt bodies, just like saucers, aren't they? Uh, so we may have learned a great deal. The government certainly isn't saying that's where they got any of their input. But there's certainly been that hint from the insiders. There have also been rumors that uh, some of the stealth technology has come from examination yes. of uh, That's been a yeah. rumor. That Could you comment on why the conscious mind is erased and the subconscious is not? Uh, I, there's absolutely no way to understand how this works in the abduction experiences. Um, obviously, there is such a degree of control that uh, they can, for instance, free someone like this, you know, switching them off. The person has no recollection of what happens. All the uh, automatic impulses continue. They breathe and everything. You wonder how you can hit only certain ner nervous centers, uh, how you can eliminate certain kinds of knowledge, uh, memory, how certain cover stories can be put into that person's mind, which seems to be able to happen. We literally don't know how, what the mechanisms are. So it couldn't really be an indication of their limit? No, I think it's highly possible that uh, they could conceivably block out all memory. I also am not certain that even th when we do use hypnosis, that we're necessarily getting everything. Uh, we, you know, it, the whole thing is a kind of on-the-job training for everybody involved. Uh, and the abductee is... Uh, 
every abductee is a little bit different in this respect, how much he or she remembers. I've had cases where a person remembered everything of one case consciously and has had an earlier abduction that they remembered nothing of except it emerged under hypnosis. No, that's the same person. Why would something be fully present in memory and something fully absent except through the use of hypnosis? Uh, it doesn't seem to be a solution. It appear mm -hmm. to be reasonably clear that they know a lot more about our brains than we do. And I worked on uh, one uh, case over two years with another uh, man using hypnosis in Boulder, Colorado. And in that period of time, it was clear that at some point in the abduction, they took the man's mind out, literally, and then they put it back. And when they put it back, they had added something. He was aware that there was something in his mind that wasn't there before, and it took several months to just break through a little bit of what it was they've added. But now, um, eight years after the abduction took place, that man is no closer to knowing what it was that was added beyond the fact that he has a sense of some kind of a responsibility or mission that he does not want and wishes that he had been left alone. But even with a lot of hypnosis, we have never ever been able to break through. And how they take a mind out and then put it back and the person is restored but with added information, I don't think anybody could explain that. I wish to thank you for your attention and I think that uh, what's been most important about our evening is to contact minds who, who are so rich and so stocked with so, such fast information and background that we have gotten a tremendous scope and a great deal of detail as a foundation not only for our research but our profound prayer and work at the altar. So I'd like to say to you Bud Hopkins, I'd like to say to you Stanton Friedman, Linda Howe and Bruce McAvee, thank you for being the flame of freedom that speaks at Summit University Forum. You've been watching Summit University Forum with Elizabeth Clare Potter. Summit University Forum, where the flame of freedom speaks. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Summit University, Box A, Livingston, Montana, 59047-1390. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address. For information on the full-length version of this and other Summit University forums, as well as lectures on the defense of freedom by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, call toll-free 1-800-323-5228 or write Summit University Press, Box A, Livingston, Montana, 59047-1390.